this video, what I want to do is to discuss William Clifford's The Ethics of Belief. Alright everybody, what we're going to do now is we're going to get into William Clifford's The Ethics of Belief uh, from 1877. Now, this piece um, is not directly about engineering ethics per se. Oh, well, it's not about engineering ethics at all in terms of the content therein. But as we're going through this and we look at William James's response in uh, my next analysis, I want us to think about how we can apply this to engineering ethics and our notions of belief, especially when it comes to uh, preventing uh, those disasters, um, those mishaps, uh, those um, errors that we've mentioned since the beginning of the semester. So, first of all, Clifford begins this piece by telling a story. Actually, he tells two stories, but the first one is this. And so he starts immediately with a thought experiment. This is something that philosophers do sometimes. Well, they say, think about the situation. So here, here's what he says. Imagine scenario number one. A ship owner was about to send to see an emigrant ship, okay, people traveling to somewhere else. He knew that she was old, not over well built at the first, that she'd men seen many seas and climbs and often had needed repairs. So it's, this is not a brand new ship. It's an old ship. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's probably time to retire it. Doubts had been suggested to him that possibly she was not seaworthy. Like maybe it's time to let's uh, mothball this thing. These doubts preyed upon his mind and made him unhappy. He thought that perhaps he ought to have her thoroughly overhauled and refitted, even though this should put him to great expense. So I don't want to fix this because it's going to be expensive. So he goes, you know, it's kind of old, but you know, I don't really want to pay for that right now. Before the ship sailed, however, he succeeded in overcoming these melancholy reflections. He said to himself that she had gone safely through so many voyages and weathered so many storms that it was idle to suppose she would not come safely home from this trip also. So maintaining the belief that, you know, the ship's made it so many times, how, how could this time be any different? He would put his trust in providence, which could hardly fail to protect all these unhappy families that were leaving their fatherland to seek better times elsewhere. How could something bad happen? This is for a good cause. He would dismiss from his mind all ungenerous suspicions about the honesty of builders and contractors. In such ways, he acquired a sincere and comfortable conviction that his vessel was thoroughly safe and seaworthy. He watched her departure with a light heart and benevolent wishes for the success of the exiles in their strange new home that was to be. All right, so I want you to pay attention so far to what, what what's going on here. This person has an old ship. It's had its day. Probably it's it's old, so it maybe should go under repairs or be retired. And he just thinks, this person thinks, you know, it's made so many trips. What could possibly go wrong? And so notice some of the language here. He succeeded in overcoming these melancholy reflections. Uh, he put his trust in providence. Um, he dismissed from his mind all ungenerous suspicions. Okay, to the point where every time a doubt might come up where, hey, maybe this w isn't going to go so well, this person suppressed that doubt. And, you know, waves the ship goodbye when they go out to sea. And he got his insurance money when she went down in mid-ocean and told no tales. So, knowing that there were problems with the ship, suppressing these doubts, overcoming the melancholy reflections, ship went down, everybody on board died, and he got the insurance money. Now notice it's not saying that he, this was not this person's intention to get the insurance money, to gleefully, I'm going to send all these people out to sea. <laughs> That's my plan. That's not what's going on here. But Clifford then says this. What shall we say of him? Now think about what we said with responsibility last time. Is this person responsible for these deaths at sea? Well, Clifford says, surely this, that he was verily guilty of the death of those men. 
but he didn't kill them. He didn't like send. He didn't like shoot the ship with a torpedo and sink it. Neither did he want this to happen. He really thought that it was everything was going to be fine. It worked out before, but nevertheless, Clifford says he was guilty of the deaths of those people. Now, already here, we can see how I hope you can see how this applies to engineering ethics when it comes to the construction of but whether it be infrastructure it could be infrastructure bridges and buildings software uh, any really anything within the domain of engineering when something goes wrong is negligence yields culpability now look notice what he says uh it's admitted he did sincerely believe in the soundness of his ship he really thought it was going to be fine but the sincerity of his conviction it can no it can in no wise help him. So sometimes we look at um, conviction or the earnestness of belief as a virtue. Clifford saying that doesn't really do anything because he had no right to believe on such evidence as was before him. He had a belief, but he actually had no right to have the belief that he had based on the evidence at his disposal. He had acquired his belief not by honestly earning it in patient investigation, but by stifling his doubts. So he had the belief that everything was going to be fine because he kept suppressing the doubts that he had. And although in the end he may have felt so sure about it that he could not think otherwise, yet inasmuch as he had knowingly and willingly worked himself into that frame of mind, he must be held responsible for it. And then he gives a couple of he throws us another version. He says, take the same story, let's do another version with it. Suppose the ship was not unsound at all, but she made her voyage safely, and many others after it. Well, let's, so let's, let's say everything in the story was the same. The ship's old. Uh, it's, seen, it's, it's seen better days. He still suppresses the doubts, but uh, the ship makes it to its destination. This makes everything fine. No. This individual is just as wrong. They're not culpable for the deaths because nobody died. But he says, uh, will that diminish the guilt of the owner? Not one jot. When an action is done, is once done, it is right or wrong forever. No accidental failure of its good or evil fruits can possibly alter that. The man would not have been innocent. He would only have been not found out. So the, the problem here in this ethical situation is not the death of the people. So you can see Clifford's not talking about uh, consequentialist ethic. It's not simply wrong because people died. That's bad, surely. But it would have been just as morally wrong and uh, epistemologically foolish for someone to have this belief and act on this belief. This person is just as guilty even though people didn't die in this version. He says, it's just it's not that he's innocent, he's just nobody, nobody else would know about it. The question of right or wrong has to do with the origin of his belief, not the matter of it, not what it was, but how he got it. The problem here is why he believed what he believed, and it's that he decided he wanted to believe that way in spite of the evidence to the contrary. He had, notice Clifford says this again, this is a refrain that I want you to know, and this will be on the final exam. He... But whether he had to write, the question is whether he had a right to believe on such evidence was before him. And he said above here, he had no right to believe on such evidence as was before him. That's story number one. Story number two. Imagine this. There was once an island in which some of the inhabitants professed a religion teaching neither the doctrine of original sin nor that of eternal punishment. That would be Christianity, that people are born into sin, um, that... God will punish people for their sp sin. Now, imagine, imagine there's a there's a uh, an island where people don't people don't have that belief. A suspicion got abroad that the professors of this religion had made use of unfair means to get their doctrines taught to children. They were accused of wresting the laws of their country in such a way as to remove children from the care of their natural and legal guardians, and even stealing them away and keeping them concealed from their friends and relations. So really some of the early stuff is not important here. He's saying, imagine there's a society where people go around saying, you know, people kidnap kids. They kidnap kids, take them away from their families. This is happening all the time. Let's just assume they're saying that. 
a certain number of men form themselves into a society for the purpose of agitating the public about this matter. More people need to know that our kids are being kidnapped. They published grave accusations against individual cit citizens of the highest position and character and did all in their power to injure these citizens. They're, in, they're stealing our children in their exercise of their professions. So great was the noise they made that a commission was appointed, like or a governmental uh, agency or commission has been appointed to investigate the facts. But after the commission had found, had carefully inquired into all the evidence that could be caught, got, it appeared that the accused were innocent. Not only had they been accused on insufficient evidence, but the evidence of their innocence was such that the agitators might have eas easily have obtained if they had attempted a fair inquiry. So he's saying. You know, the commission didn't have special evidence. They didn't find, you know, some secrets out. Like, this is something where the people making the accusations, if they had just looked at the evidence, they would have come to the same c conclusion that this commission, which is like a committee, except it doesn't. Commissions just look, s look at something. They don't make final decisions. That's what a committee does. For although they had sincerely and conscientiously believed in the charges they'd made, people are stealing our kids. They really believed it. Yet they had no right to believe on such evidence as was before them. Their sincere convictions, instead of being honestly earned by patient inquiry, were stolen by listening to the voice of prejudice and passion. So again, the problem here is uh, we look sometimes, again, at sincerity. People really, really believe what they believe. Is that their right to do so? Clifford says no to be guided by prejudice and passion. Now, why is it wrong? Can't, isn't that kind of like freedom of belief or freedom of speech in some way? I, can, I have the right to believe what I want. Well, Clifford's going to say you have the ability to, but you don't have the right to. In fact, it's injurious to others. Um, so I'm, I'm, those are the two stories I want to focus on. I want you to think about how those stories can be applied in other areas. So consider this. In the first place, uh, he says some other things. I'm going to skip around here, so I'm still on the I'm on the bottom of page two. In the first place, let us admit that, so far as it goes, this view of the case is right and necessary. Okay, um, that we have to pursue things with a with a due diligence. Right, because even when a man's belief is so fixed that he cannot think otherwise, he still has a choice in regard to the action suggested by it and so cannot escape the duty of investigating on the ground of the strength of his convictions. So y you can believe whatever you want, but you still have a choice to act on it. So if you have some kind of peculiar belief, maybe you can hold it, but you shouldn't necessarily act on it, especially if you don't know what you're talking about. And uh, that's necessary because those who are not yet can take capable of controlling their feelings and thoughts must have a plain rule dealing with overt acts. So hypothetically, you can have certain beliefs that you haven't had confirmed by evidence, but m but you, it's still your decision whether or not you're act, you act on them. This ends up being a problem, though, because this being premise is necessary, it becomes clear that it's not sufficient and that our previous judgment is required to supplement it, for it is not possible so to sever the belief from the action it suggests as to condemn the one without condemning the other. No man holding a strong belief on one side of a question, or even wishing to hold a belief on one side, can investigate it with such fairness and completeness as if you're really in doubt and unbiased. So, in your head, if you've already decided what you believe about something, you can try to be as objective as you want. You can't be, because you've already committed yourself to a particular position that's going to sway your judgment because you've already committed yourself to a position. And so this whole uh, dichotomy between believing something and acting on it, oh, I can believe something, but I'm not, I'll fine, I, w I won't act on it unless I get the evidence. You're already acting on the evidence, or the lack of evidence. You're already acting on it. And here's another thing about beliefs. Um, nor is it truly a belief at all, which has not some influence upon the actions of him who holds it. If you believe something, it will affect your actions. It might seem minor, but all our beliefs that we possess influence our actions. We act in accordance with our beliefs. Now, sometimes we act out of, accord out of accordance with our beliefs. We believe something is morally right or morally wrong, and we say we believe something's right and we do the wrong thing anyway. 
you know, there, but we're conscious that we're acting out of accordance with it. Here, he who truly believes that which prompts him to action has looked upon the action to lust after it. He has committed it already in his heart. That's the way beliefs work. So this could have... Now, Clifford definitely has in mind religious beliefs here, and w William James, like I said, is going to respond to that. But I want you to apply this as a question to when we're looking at engineering ethics. When someone, you know, does a check on something, like, yeah, sure, everything's fine, it's all good. It could be something as simple as, uh, you know, I'm a responsible person, I really believe that. I locked all the doors in my house tonight. Well, did you? Did you go around and look and see that they're all locked? No, but I'm responsible. I wouldn't have done that. And then you wake up the next morning and your doors are all unlocked. Well, well I didn't do it. When you're consigned to a belief, even if you don't have the evidence, you do a quick, you know, just a quick check. Like, oh yeah, that door's locked. Oh, I forgot to lock that one. Better safe than sorry. But when we're... Uh, passionate in a particular belief about something, we're less likely to check it out because we've already decided it is true. And here's another point that Clifford makes, uh, and I want you to think about how, how this ties into the code of ethics and the notion of public safety. No man's belief, and again, he's 19th century, 1877, so the, always using masculine language really before about, I'll say 1980. Uh, no man's belief is, in any case, a private manner which concerns himself alone. Our lives are guided by that general conception of the course of things which has been created by society for social purposes. Our words, our phrases, our forms, and our processes and modes of thought are common property, fashioned and perfected from age to age, an heirloom which every succeeding generation inherits as a precious deposit and a sacred trust to be handled on to the next one not unchanged but enlarged and purified with some clear marks of its proper handiwork. Beliefs are something that are held in common. Not all, but they're private beliefs. I think this about somebody, you think this about that, you think this about politics, you think this about religion. But what he's saying here is that your private beliefs that one has, uh, to quote the, the poetry of John Donne, <laughs> no man is an island. Your beliefs affect others. I think uh, with what's going on right now, the fact that we're, I'm making this from home at 2 o'clock in the morning, rather than us meeting for our normal scheduled time, a lot of this precautions is for the sake of the, the common good. Some people might think like right now that um, uh, COVID-19, for example, is, oh, you know, it's not a big deal. If you're not an epidemiologist, which I am not either, I'm less inclined to intr to trust your judgment on it. Uh, and so it's, it's, in, it's, I think, good to yield to expertise to people who have the knowledge to evaluate the evidence. And I think evidence dictate, dictates that we can yield to or appeal to experts in a particular field for something. It doesn't mean they're right on everything, but we have good reasons to believe so. And this is part of, of what it means to have sufficient evidence doesn't mean that one is always correct in the evidence, but that someone has re you have good you have good reasons. You might something a mistake or an error or one of those disasters might transpire where everything that ought to have been done was done and something nevertheless happens anyway. But if something does happen when you did everything you were supposed to, you have good reasons for maintaining that something should not not in a moral sense but in a hypothetical sense, it should not have happened, even if it does. Now, uh, what he warns us against here is when we're looking at things on insufficient evidence, be careful not to nourish, that is, feed a belief by suppressing doubts and avoiding in investigation. Uh, you know, I've seen in, like, uh, in comedies and cartoons, when someone doesn't want to come to terms to something, you know, no, 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 not, not listening, that kind of thing. They just don't want to deal with it. Um, also, in that piece that we I talked about earlier in the semester, uh, Euthyphro by Plato, he's, uh, Socrates is talking to Euthyphro about the nature of what, pi the, the word tohosan, or piety, what, what is piety, which is kind of like goodness or righteousness or justice doing the right thing. And... Uh, by the end of it, 
after giving some unsatisfying answers to Socrates about what piety is, uh, Euthyphro ends by the character Euthyphro saying, I don't have time for this. I don't want to deal, deal with this. I don't want to think about it too hard. This stuff's really difficult. It basically gives up after saying at the beginning of Euthyphro, I, Euthyphro, would not be superior to the majority of men if I did not have accurate knowledge of all such things. All such things. So he goes in being really confident in his beliefs that he knows exactly what he's doing. But by the time you get to the end, he said, "This is just, I don't want to think about it. And sometimes I hear people make these kind of claims. Like, yeah, I, don't wanna th- I, I just don't want to think about it too hard. It'll, it'll upset me if I entertain my doubts. Yeah, but it might upset you, but you might be harming everybody else by not looking into the doubts that you have, especially when human lives are involved. And he says this affects everyone. This is not this kind of truth-keeping and responsibility, uh, duty even, to look at the evidence of things is not something just for the elite. He says, it's not only the leader of men, the statesman, the philosopher, or poet that owes this bounden duty to mankind. Every rustic who delivers in the village alehouse his slow, infrequent sentences may help to kill or keep alive the fatal superstitions which clog his race. Every hard-worked wife of an artisan may transmit to her children beliefs which shall knit society together or rend it in pieces. No simplicity of mind, no obscurity of station can escape the universal duty of questioning all that we believe. A couple things here. One, again, it's not just something for the elite. The person, <laughs> the, the Budweiser delivery guy, the stay-at-home mom, all of these people uh, can pass on beliefs to others, to people either in the workplace or in the home, and so there's a responsibility of everyone to have a duty of what of not just believing things with sufficient evidence. Notice what he says here, questioning all that we believe. Now, here's something I hear sometimes. What does it mean to question everything? It does not mean to dismiss everything. Sometimes I see this as a, people will say this as a critique of postmodernism. It's just d- dumping everything. Nothing is true. Everything's relative. That's a mischaracterization of postmodernism uh, and even certain forms of relativism to, to a degree. We talked about moral relativism early on, which is a not a robust moral theory I- in my view. But questioning all that we believe doesn't mean that we throw it all out, but at least we look at the parameters of it. Why do we believe this to be the case? That's part of questioning. Okay, That's part of doubting. Uh, even Augustine said far before Descartes, dubito. Ergo sum, I doubt, therefore I am. Okay, that's what we should be doing. That's how we know we're alive is by our doubting things. Now, he doesn't say this is easy. He says it's true that this duty is a hard one, and the doubt which comes out of it is often a very bitter thing. Stopping and really thinking about something and looking at our doubts is can be painful. But in good deontological fashion, there's a certain sense in which sometimes a duty is a duty... <laughs> the nature of duty is that it's difficult. It's never easy to do the things that we're supposed to do. Um, let me move forward a little bit. Uh, let's see. Here's where he says this at the end of this first section, very clearly and succinctly. Here's his thesis that I want you to know. And it's really his third time saying it. To sum up, it is wrong, always everywhere and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence okay period if a man holding a belief which he was taught in childhood or persuaded of afterwards keeps down and pushes away any doubts which arise about in his mind purposefully avoids the reading of books and the company of men that call into question or discuss it and regards as impious unholy those questions which cannot easily be asked without disturbing it the life of that man is one long sin against mankind. Um, this is kind of how <laughs> I look at people that uh, believe things like vaccines cause autism or, or something like that. What evidence do you have to support it? There, there is none. Um, there are a couple. <laughs> you can look at a couple of opinions and positions, and opinions are great, and those are fine. But when you don't, when you, when you have the evidence that you can look at, and you go, nope. 
purposefully avoids the readings of books. I, mean, I can read the actual literature on it. Nope, all that stuff's too hard anyway. It's all science. I don't want to learn all that. I just I feel it in my gut. We'll talk. We'll, we'll, this has to do with the notion of truthiness that I'll also talk about. I think uh, next time as well, and the company of men calling into question that discuss that discuss it and regards as impious. How dare you challenge my views on this? That's offensive to me. I already have my views and my convictions, and they're sincere for me. How dare you? Nope. And that's one that's injurious. I think people that don't vaccine, or people right now that are, you know, uh, the last time, the last time I was in Aiken, um, it's been a while, but the last time I was in Aiken, some social distancing measures with all this had already been going on. I remember driving past uh, Odell Weeks on the south side of Aiken. 50 people out there in a crowd barbecuing stuff. Probably not a good idea right now. And so <laughs> even even now, I think a lot of our responsibility of what we do uh, in the context of this current pandemic is very much in line with what Clifford's saying, and I think this is very timely for us. In fact, I think a lot of the stuff that we're talking about in ethics that we talked about early on in the semester with different meta-ethical theories I've seen many of those positions acted out <laughs> or discussed uh, in Congress and in political discussions and ramifications about what we do in terms of the political response, you know, what emergency bills should be passed, what should we do about un unemployment, which unemployment right now is the highest it's ever been in the history of this country. That happened in the past 30 days. So it really, I think at this point, last two weeks. Uh, and it went... And even then, it was like a couple of weeks ago, it was 3.3 million, I think, unemployment claims, highest ever. Uh, I think last I looked, it was something like over 10 million. So it had tripled uh, in, I think, about a week. How do we respond to those things? How should so we do social distancing? Should we be wearing masks? Should we be wearing gloves? How do those work? Okay, do we, is it really that big of a deal? And so, like, right now, because of my trust in epidemiologists who understand how viruses work, um, like I, I have uh, here at home I have my kids my parents live two hours away you know I keep checking in with them seeing how they're doing do I go to my parents well my parents are older my father's a diabetic they my, th that puts him in a uh, group which is more at least uh, the, the way I understand the data now more susceptible to not being asymptomatic if someone in my family was a carrier so as much as I'd like to go see my parents while we're all out of school and I don't have to show up at the university, I'm not going to do that right now for the out of a sense of duty to take care of the lives of others. If I have to go to the store, which I have, I'm really trying to keep away from people as much as possible. Not just because I'm afraid of these people are going to give it to me, but if for some reason I were a carrier, I don't want to give it to them. Okay? That sense of duty and the beliefs associated with it are exactly the kind of thing that he's talking about, which is why I think it's our duty to, as this, as this develops now uh, in, this, in the nature of this pandemic, and this has very much to do with engineering and <laughs> in medicine. Another aspect of this I'm thinking about doesn't have to do with um, belief necessarily, but how should manufacturers respond to this? People, <laughs> the My Pillow company, uh, they're making masks now. What's Elon Musk going to do? A month, um, Two months ago, he tweeted, this is dumb. I can post the tweet up on Blackboard if it still exists. Uh, that he said, the panic about this is dumb. He said that, I think, late February. Uh, and if you don't know Elon Musk, he's, you know, he's behind SpaceX, he's behind Tesla. What are, what are corporations doing? Some corporations, I know, in Texas that usually made vodka are making hand sanitizer because there's not too much of a difference between those two things. Um, other other companies are doing some other things, changing what they're doing out of a sense of responsibility. This is what they should do based on what they know about what's going on. Again, I think it's incumbent upon us to stay as informed as we possibly can. This is definitely in conjunction with Ross's duty of self-improvement. We have a responsibility to acquire as much evidence we, as, as we can in order to maintain the beliefs that we hold not just to hold them but to maintain them if you're going to believe something and I think this is true for anything I, I, as a professor I've always maintained that I'm someone I'm not trying to 
uh, at least I, I've, I've tried to act this way. I've never tried to really, I don't believe I should try and change people's beliefs, but what I want you to do as a philosopher is if you hold a position, which I might not agree with, it might be a religious position, it might be a political position, it might be a philosophical position, it might be an artistic position or an aesthetic position, whatever you believe, know why you believe it and be able to back it up. That's it. Know what you believe, know the content of it, know why you believe it, and, at and have be saturated in the evidence to support your position. I think, it, I think that is uh, essential. Now, of course, Clifford here, this is directed at religious beliefs, but I think we can apply this <coughs> excuse me, to those beliefs that we have, regardless of what, what kind of uh, genre of belief that they are, because as Clifford has already said, the beliefs that we have affect those around us. They have a kind of mimetic quality. He goes into a little bit of a side here that I'm not going to get into. Um, th then he tries to pedal this back just a little bit. Are we supposed to question everything, doubt everything? Wait, no, wait a minute. If we're not supposed to believe anything without sufficient evidence, aren't there some obvious things that we can't believe then? Like, how do I know that I exist? How do I know that other people are not just a robots? And that they're actually people. How do I how do I know that? How do I know that George Washington actually existed? How do I know that the Earth is round? It's not like I've ever been up in space and looked at a ball. How do I know those things? And so he asks this kind of question: Are we then to become universal skeptics, doubting everything, afraid always to put one foot before the other until we have personally tested the firmness of the road? I mean, <laughs> when you step outside, how do you know the ground's not going to sink? Well, I haven't tested the you know the geolo geological stability of my front yard. So how can I believe that when I step outside, or even when I get out of bed in the morning, the ground is going to be firm? Stop it. Because we have what sociologists will call a stock of knowledge. So we'll see that we have a couple of things that we can we can think about uh, where we have, and this is like my my acquiescence to epidemiologists when it comes to this pandemic. Well, how dare I? I'm not the one doing the scientific research on it. How can I yield to them? We can yield to people who are authoritative on positions because they're the ones doing the evidence for us. For the same reason that, you know, the, the pots and pans, like if I have an iron skillet, I'm not a blacksmith. I didn't hew the thing out of iron myself and make it. Someone else did that for me. It doesn't mean that I can't use it because I didn't make it. I didn't build my car, but I can still drive it same thing when it comes to knowledge acquisition. Other people can do the work uh, in research and in science, and then that knowledge can be transmitted. Again, sociologists, I think it's uh, Peter Berger, I, I believe, memory serves, refers to this as the social stock of knowledge. So he gives the example of the spectroscope, and because of the spectroscope, which is a instrument that lets us know, based on uh, color, what elements things out in space are composed of <coughs> excuse me and so um, so you hold it up and you point it towards the Sun certain colors will come up and those colors correspond to uh, particular uh, elements on the periodic table so when you point a spectroscope towards the sun towards the Sun I don't remember what color pops up but you can deduce from that, that the Sun is made of hydrogen none of us have been to the Sun we would burn up we know that the sun is comprised of hydrogen and also helium because of nuclear fusion, but primarily of hydrogen because we have the instruments to measure that. Well, how do we know that? Aren't we trusting the instruments too much? Uh, well, listen, what we have there, it's not as though, this is not magic. This is not as though we, we looked up and said, ah, the sun is made of hydrogen. We have instruments, and we also have theories that explain how the instruments work. So there's a whole framework which undergirds the conclusions that we make in science. It's not just science. We can also look at things in history. So he gives the example uh, from, I want to say Thucydides. Uh, the, he says, how do we know that there was a siege of Syracuse, uh, not Syracuse, New York, Syracuse in Greece, uh, in the Peloponnesian War? Well, there's a bunch of historical manuscripts which confer confirm this. Now, you could be a conspiracy theorist, and the conspiracy theorist is where you believe things, but definitely without sufficient evidence, but you have a, a 
feeling about something being the case. Um, but we have all these books and manuscripts and things that we can find, and historically, <laughs> Clifford makes this claim, a consp conspiracy theorist I think would deny it, we find that also that men do not, as a rule, that is typically, forge books and histories without special motive. Like, it happens, but there really has to be a lot going on to make that happen. Uh, people, uh, we can look at the historical evidence, and there's historical evidence there which confirms it. So when we want to say something like, how do we know George Washington was the first president? It's not just a matter of going, going to Google or Wikipedia. We can actually find a litany of information to confirm this that is documented. And we can trust historians on it, but we can also, if we had the wherewithal, look it up ourselves. And at this point, I think it's important to say, too, this is not to say, again, or let me reiterate this, this is not to say that people, if someone has, like a conspiracy theorist, has a hunch about something, it doesn't mean that they, because it's predicated on a conspiracy theory, or be from a lack of evidence, that what they're claiming is not actually true. It might be. It's that even if it is, you don't have the right to believe it because you don't have the evidence to get there. Uh, this is something that happens. Uh, this is bad logic sometimes. So, for example, listen, everything I'm going to say is true. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Therefore, my toothpaste is minty. Now, my toothpaste does happen to have some mint flavoring in it. Everything I said was true. 2 plus 2 equals 4. My toothpaste is minty. And I'm saying 2 plus 2 equals 4. Therefore, my toothpaste is minty. My toothpaste is minty because 2 plus 2 equals 4. Everything I just said is true, and I still believe my toothpaste is minty, but it's not minty because 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, there's no evidence to support that claim whatsoever. Even though all the claims are true, one relying on the other does not make it so. Also, I've mentioned this before, correlation does not equal ca causation, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Um, that is, uh, after this, therefore, because of this. Uh, probably the most ridiculous thing that I've seen so far that I want to go ahead and say, hypothetically, may be true. I have no reason to believe this, and that's why I object to people saying it as though it is true, is that this whole COVID-19 virus is due to the advent of 5G technology. This is a position, I'm not making this up, you can go look it up yourself, just type in COVID-19, 5G, you will see all kinds of conspiracy theories about the virus is because of the new 5G telephone technology. And people going, hmm, coincidence? I don't think so. Yeah, I think it's a coincidence. Now, again, I want to say, there's a hypothetical possibility. I, I will grant that maybe it is the case, but there is no evidence to support that position whatsoever. And if I'm wrong in that, bring it my way. Let me look at it. Okay? Same reason, uh, you know, when people say, like, the Earth is flat. Maybe it is. It doesn't seem like any of the technology that we have would work if that's the case. And, of course... You know, oh, people are, that's what the, that's what, you know, <laughs> the deep state wants you to think. Well, maybe, and maybe it is flat. Maybe we've all been lied to, but there's no reason why I have evidence to believe that. Okay, even if it is true, there's not evidence to support it. Okay, this is, this is how we do uh, criminal courts in this country. Okay, we don't, we're not saying whether or not someone is guilty we say whether or not in court, we say whether or not if someone is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not just do I think they did it or not, do we have the evidence to convict? If you don't, that's why someone can get, can be acquitted of a crime that they did, that they did actually commit, but it wasn't demonstrated in court. There wasn't enough evidence to demonstrate the point. Doesn't mean that it didn't happen, but there wasn't enough evidence to demonstrate it. Uh, the converse is also true. Well, all right, let's keep going. He gives uh, a summary here at the end, and uh, I want to look at these last couple of positions. He also says there's some things that we can presuppose that are fine. So, for example, he says, you know, when we're talking about the claims like about George Washington and the Sun, these are things that are, are, are you know, are talking about you know the siege of Syracuse or the Sun is comprised of hydrogen. These are things out of our everyday experience. How could we possibly believe them? Well, because there are specialists who do deal with these things, okay? Uh, documents, <laughs> documents 
uh, give internal evidence that they were produced among people who forged books in the name of... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if we uh, look at this... This is the wrong paragraph. But if we look at things, we can see that there is a group of people, or there are groups of people who are specialists who we can rely on. They're not infallible, but we can rely on them. Um, here's the paragraph I was looking for. Um, here's one presupposition that we can have, which is fine. We may add then to our experience on the assumption of a uniformity in nature. We may fill our picture of what it is as experience gives it, <laughs> gives it us in such a way as to make whole consistent with this uniform uniformity. So we can presuppose the uniformity of nature. To us, the universe is always the same. It works the same way. Gravity always is, uh, has the same, you know, or even with Einsteinian relativity, Einsteinian physics. The, the way gravity works is, is constant. The way the speed of light, the speed of light is a constant. The way things work in nature, the forces that we see are constant, at least for us in our experience. Maybe somewhere else in the universe, things work differently. Maybe somewhere else in the universe, gravity does the opposite of what it does elsewhere. But we can say, at least in our everyday experience, uniformity of nature is, is how we do this. That's why you can say things like, you know, uh, well, maybe a miracle happened. Uh, that is to not to necessarily deny the existence of miracles, but there's no reason to believe that based on a notion of the uniformity of nature. So saith Clifford. Um, that's why he says, no evidence, therefore, can justify us in believing the truth of a statement which is contrary to or outside the uniformity of nature. Some, something happened. If someone comes to you with a report and says something like, uh, someone was dead and then they came back to life. Like the, my, my grandma was in the grave for, I mean, I'm not talking this thing that people do sometimes where they say someone died and you know their heart stopped for like two minutes and then they were resuscitated. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking someone was buried in a coffin for three months. Grandma's back. Okay, she dug herself out, and now she's talking. That is outside of our everyday experience. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm not saying someone couldn't be resuscitated after being dead for a long time. But that is out of accordance with the way that nature normally works. And so, even if it's hypothetically possible, uh, if someone just says this happened, we have no right nor reason to believe them. If our experience is such that it cannot be filled up consistently with uniformity, all we have a right to conclude is that there is something wrong somewhere. Okay, but so the uniformity of nature is essential for doing science. It's essential for uh, doing engineering. So when we're talking about like infrastructure again, you know, will the br will the bridge hold? Well, the bridge goblins will keep it up. We don't have to check on it. Everything will be fine. Uh, it could be everything from uh, you know, uh, you know, God wills it. It'll stay up. It'll just do it either based on our thought power on some kind of supernatural thought power. Clifford's saying, mm -mm. Now, here he says, okay, if we have a uniformity of nature, how could we possibly have evidence for believing that? He answers it in this way. Are we then bound to believe that nature is absolutely and universally uniform? That it's always the same. Uh, the universe works the exact same way in all times and all places. Because it's not... If, if, the, if the Earth came into being four and a half billion years ago, we weren't there. Well, he says... No, we don't know that. We don't know if it's always uniform. We have no right to we have no right to believe anything of that kind that it's uniform that the universe is the exact same everywhere in all places at all times. I've heard certain scientists say this like Neil deGrasse Tyson uh today. Uh, well, not today like today, but in recent years. Or someone like Richard Dawkins as well. <coughs> Excuse me. The rule only tells us that informing beliefs which go beyond our experience we may make the assumption that nature is practically uniform so far as we cons are concerned. So at least to us in our everyday experience, uniformity works in this way. Okay? So uh, we can at least go on. This is one assumption that we can have. Then he comes here to the end. To sum up, we may believe what goes beyond our experience only when it is inferred from that experience by the assumption that we do not know <laughs> is like what we know. That what we do not know is like what we know. So that's how we can use the uniformity of nature. We can say things work like this here. They should work like this here too. That's how we can know, you know, the freezing point of water, you know, obviously given altitude and pressure considerations, is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 0 degrees Celsius 
here in North America, it's the same thing in Australia. It's not as though water starts freezing at 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Australia. Nope, uniformity of nature. It's the same everywhere. It'll be the same on the moon. It'll be the same on the Mars. If you find water on Mars uh, and it's below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius, it's going to be frozen. That's just the uniformity of nature. And we can assume that. When we find water and it's a certain temperature, it's going to be frozen and not liquid. Might it be otherwise? Might it we find some place where water is liquid even though it's below that temperature? Hypothetically possible, but we don't, ha we don't have no right to assume that. We may further, we may believe the statement of another person when there is reasonable ground for supposing that he knows the matter of which he speaks. If someone knows what they're talking, like they're an expert in their field, we have good reasons for believing them. If they're not, um, we have no reason to believe them. All right, now if someone might not be an expert in a field, but have some familiarity with things. So, um, you know, some uh, a person, so, uh, someone, um, some people in my family are good with cars. They're not, they've never been professional mechanics in their life, but they, they don't know stuff with cars. I trust their judgment on it because they know what they're talking about, even if they don't have a degree in it. So I don't want to, I don't want to come across as some kind of elitist in that regard. But when people specialize or have, if they have knowledge or familiarity with something, we can trust their judgment on it. Whether that be uh, amateur, uh, amateur in the sense of non-professional, like it's not degreed or someone's degreed, uh, we can trust their judgment on things. Not that they're infallible, but we can trust their judgment. And that someone is, if someone has that kind of expertise, again, whether it's formal or professional or it's amateurish, that they're speaking the truth so far as they know it. Finally, he says this refrain one more time again. Clifford, it is wrong in all cases to believe on insufficient evidence and where it is presumption to doubt and to investigate, there is worse than presumption. There it is worse than presumption to believe. So, believing things without having evidence for it? Stop it. Now what I want you to do with this is think about, uh, because there will be an uh, essay question on this for the final exam, I want you to think about the ramifications for this uh, for engineering ethics. Some people have said, and William James will say this to some degree, and, and William James is very much opposed, the next person we're going to read, William James is very much opposed to what Clifford is saying. Um, even though he never met Clifford. Clifford died, I think, not long after this. Uh, and he doesn't, he's not too uh, acerbic to Clifford. That is, he's not really mean about Clifford, but, but he, he doesn't like this position. And other people say Clifford's position here is way too extreme. We can never believe anything without sufficient evidence? Well, how do, there are some things surely that we take on presumption. Like again, I, I mentioned before, like the existence of other minds. How do we know something like the Earth wasn't created five minutes ago, and we all just have memories? We can't disprove that. So what about arguments from ignorance and some arguments from silence? What do we do with those? Well, like, like I said, William James is going to say, well, he's Clifford's got a point, but there are some times uh, where it's appropriate to believe some things where you don't have all the evidence, and it's still appropriate. And James is going to give us a framework for that. But I want you to think again with this of what Clifford's saying. Is this applicable to engineering ethics? Is it too extreme of a position? Are there ways where maybe a more softened position would be entirely appropriate? Or is this just entirely nonsense? And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer on that. Not in a moral sense, but in terms of getting at the case of what we're talking about. So uh, next one of these, we'll look at William James's uh, The Will to Believe and then we'll talk about notions of uh, truthiness as well. So, like I said, if you need to contact me, thomasb at usca.edu. Uh, answering emails as quickly as I can. Uh, things have uh, changed in the home dynamic where I'm you know, trying to do a lot of stuff. I'm sure all of you are having a similar situation. But um, we'll keep this going. Uh, I think frequency of about one a week of these things, maybe a little bit maybe a little bit more uh, next week. I think I have an opportunity to get some more stuff out there. Um, but if you, like I said, if you have questions about your case study report due on the 24th of April, reach out to me, please. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye.